Welcome back to our podcast and we're in the final week of our 40 days of prayer. Um, so we've got Malcolm here who's going to be sharing on Sunday. Malcolm, it's been quite a journey over the last few weeks. Um, before we get into any of the content, what's been your highlight of the 40 days of prayer? Right. Um, I've put you on the spot. You now. did there, but that's okay. Um, the highlight has actually been seeing the amount of engagement there's been with people with some things I didn't necessarily think they would engage with. So... I've seen people um, chasing me down to ask about things or comment on things like fasting or whatever, which, oh, right, it's really landed, which is really good. That's really exciting. Mm. Yeah. I, it's been really great seeing across all the ages mm. the the engagement and excitement. Um, yeah, hear, hearing people really motivated by prayer each day has been good. Yeah, it's been good. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we do post 40 days later on. But as we come to this week, what's the theme of this final week? Okay, so we've been doing this forty well, sequence of 40 days. And uh, this final week, the 40 days, is the, the days between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension. And we read about that in Matthew and Luke and John and, and Acts and a little bit in 1 Corinthians. Those 40-day period from when Jesus rose from the dead and when he ascended. So we're going to look at that period and what went on there and what we can learn from it. So... In a nutshell, what do you think we can learn from those, <laughs> those 40 days? Well I, well, I started on thinking about this, about what did it mean to the disciples? And it seems to me that it was completely and utterly transformative for them, that 40 days. That, okay, they'd had some ideas before about Jesus and what he was and who he was and how that could work out, but they really hadn't clocked it. And then actually seeing him in resurrection the same but sort of different um and recognizing that this person they'd spent three and a half years with had complete was so much more than just their rabbi who did some amazing things he actually um had actually completely overpowered the whole power of death and that transformed everything for them about how they viewed him and later on about how they viewed their own lives. Um, and I think, therefore, the lesson for us is the more we can grasp who Jesus truly is, the more transformative it is for us. Um, that, you know, we can have a, and we've talked about this a bit on Sundays previously, that, you know, we can have a slightly constrained view of who Jesus is and he's quite tame and we, we think we've got him sorted. And then he does something completely, he's completely overpowered death. Oh my goodness me. And I think our own personal growth is in proportion to how big we see Jesus. Mm -hmm. Whoa. And as we've gone through these 40 days, we've obviously looked at these 40 day chunks. Um, you know, we've looked at, at Noah and we've looked at the Israelites and um, we're kind of culminating with this specific part, looking at Jesus. But I think... You know, we would quite often say that all of those stories are actually revealing who Christ is all the way through. Um, it's been quite, it's been quite exciting, quite an adventure seeing the different, I guess, the different dimensions of God or the different ways that Jesus is revealed through those different stories. So you've said there the lesson is um, that we need to expand our view of Jesus. How do we do that this week, and how do we? continue to do that once the 40 days are over how do we get a bigger view of jesus i think it's been really interesting and really encouraging as a sort of beginning how people have engaged and i've been really encouraged that people have chosen to um participate in the sort of patterns that we've established um and so as you said at the beginning you know gratitude and taking time for meditation and uh, taking time for intercession and worship and all of those things have been really really important and I'll touch on them in a minute but I think what I take most especially from these 40 days is that Jesus was preparing his closest friends for the time when he wasn't going to be there and it's very tempting to think oh well wouldn't it be nice if he'd stayed around? I mean, I'm sure I would have thought that. And yet he said to them, it's to your advantage for them to go away. I've got something better for you. 
And that better was what we see on you know a few weeks later in Pentecost when the Holy Spirit, his presence, rather than just being with a few of them in one or two isolated spots on a few isolated occasions, he actually came and dwelt them and dwelt the disciples. So if there's one lesson that we can take from it, I, um, from these 40 days that we've had, I would want it to be, Lord, daily, I want to be more filled with your Holy Spirit, just as the disciples were being prepared to be, um, because that is better, uh, remarkable though it seems, that is better for us. So I want, yeah, if we, as a result of having spent this time, 40 days, whatever, um, and in prayer and in focusing and in reflecting and in certain spiritual practices, if we can um, take from that the idea that, oh, each day I can establish a habit of inviting the Holy Spirit to fill me afresh, then it will be transformative for us as it was for them. Yeah, absolutely. So, fly on the wall. You Imagine you're there with the 12 disciples. Um, you know, the chosen doesn't really cover this part. So, as such. I haven't got there yet. No. <laughs> um, what do you think those 40 days were like? What do you think it was like, you know, post resurrection, walking with Jesus in his resurrected form? What the sort of things do you think he's teaching and saying and doing? I mean, it's not the, the public mm. ministry like he had up until that point. And do you think he's still healing people? Do you think, what, what do you think there's your, your interpretation? Okay, so some of this is um, we can know with some certainty because the script tells us a few of the things he was doing and some of the things have to be a little bit of an extrapolation. So I think the first thing he was doing is he was um, helping them to grasp that this really and truly was him because those disciples, they were going to be his authoritative witnesses. They had to be the ones that stood up in front of the um, Jewish leaders and said, no, we've seen him. This is this is true, and it you know changed their whole perspective on everything. Um, so the first thing he needed to do and did do was to convince them, hey guys, this is really me. So touch me, poke your finger there, give me a piece of fish to eat. It really, really was him, and and that was important. Second thing I think, and here's I'm a little bit speculative. I reckon he probably had to comfort them and help them get over trauma. Because, I mean, bear in mind, they'd lived with him for three and a half years. They got so excited. Everything was going so well. And then in the space of a few days, all of their hopes were shattered. I mean, just completely shattered. And I think almost certainly they were going through a whole degree of trauma. And you see it sort of hinted at <clears throat> in the story of the um, two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And, you know, and we had hoped, and you can almost hear it in their voice, we had hoped he was going to be the one. And, but, um, and so I actually think he was actually doing some uh, comforting, some reassuring, some resettling them. Hey guys, it is really me, and this is bigger than you ever could have conceived. So I think it's some of that. Then I think, and we do know this, that he was unpacking the scriptures to them. Uh, so, you know, whether it's those disciples on the road to Emmaus where he, he opened up the scriptures and showed how, you know, from Moses and the prophets, uh, all the scriptures referred to him clock that and notice, you know, we've talked about how we should read scripture through the lens of Jesus. That's exactly that. And then he went back and spoke to the rest of the 12 and uh, opened their minds to understand the scriptures and how it all referred to him. Um, so he was definitely doing that. And I wish I could have sat in on those Bible studies. <laughs> I, that would have been just awesome. Um, so there was some of that. Um, I think, I think that there's something else which is speculative. I think he just wanted to enjoy their company. You know, I hear him say, and you read it in the gospel accounts, tell them to go to Galilee. I'll meet them there. And I just think there was something that Jesus just wanted to be in that familiar place that where he had made those friendships, forged those relationships, uh, learned together about how to press forward into God's kingdom. And I just think he wanted to be there. And you see it. I mean, you know, that John's Gospel, the breakfast on the beach thing. I mean, that's just, I find that incredibly precious that Jesus wanted to be there and had made some breakfast for them and presented, served them with breakfast. Um, that, I think, was just 
a little bit of the human gene. I want to be with these friends of mine. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's that's true. He gave them there, obviously, uh, a brand new commission. What now? Oh, heck, what do we do now? Um, so you go in the world and make disciples. Okay. Um, so yeah, there was some of that as well. So yeah, a whole load of things I think were going on there. Some of them probably personal. He also had the hard conversations, you know, Thomas, the one who'd said, unless I see, yeah, come and see. Or, you know, the broken Peter who was completely shattered by his own failure. And do you love me? So yeah, there's probably a lesson there for us as well that in resurrection, Jesus has to have the hard conversations with us sometimes as well. I love that. I love that he, yeah, I love the idea that he was helping them through their trauma. I, I agree. I'd, I hadn't thought of it like that before, but that these were his closest people and they'd seen the worst and, and actually that preparing to then go and, mm. and build the church. Mm. And through these 40 days, we've, well, like we said, we've gone through a bunch of different chapters almost, mm. haven't we, in, mm. in the, the, the refreshing and the renewing through Noah and we've been through the the waiting and the stillness and the silence and, and so there has this in many ways has been a kind of preparation 40 days as we're praying as we're seeking God and also as we're interceding for our community mm -hmm. and and we're we're longing for God to you know a move of God in our community I mean I know I have I'm longing for a, yeah exactly longing for a move of God here but that's a ripple out across the nation and um so if we think of it in, in line with this story of the 40 days of preparation, um, if we've had 40 days of preparation, now what? You know, we come to the end of our 40 days. How are we as a church supposed to now go and well, bind up the brokenhearted, comfort those in mourn, yeah. set the captives free, actually bring up transformation, or even how are we supposed to continue growing as disciples of Jesus post these? See, I, I think... I alluded to earlier that you know we we've established certain spiritual practices through this period, um, and it's been really encouraging to hear people picking up on those things. Who said we had to stop? <laughs> I mean, I know some people have said, well, and, and they did say to me only a week or so ago, um, I've really loved all this input you're giving. Can we just carry on with this? This would be great. <laughs> and the answer to that is, I think, uh, no, not in that way, because the amount of resource and commitment from people like yourselves and with people like Sarah has been just, you know, it's dominated everything. Yeah. Um, but the habits that people have begun to get into of gratitude, of fasting, of reflection, you know, these things don't have to stop. In fact, best that they don't. Mm. Um, and so I would definitely encourage us if we want to see the Pentecost moment, mm. we need to continue doing what we have started doing. And we won't necessarily have the same level of input coming from these podcasts and the daily devotionals and things, mm. but that's okay. Um, there's no reason to stop any of those, those spiritual disciplines that are helping people to become more sensitive to the Holy Spirit and which will lead us to uh, a greater awareness of his presence and power in our lives, a greater experience of Pentecost in our own lives. And maybe we can share together practical levels about if people do want daily devotionals, hey, there's tons of resources out yeah. there. And we might even be able to signpost people to some of that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I, it's, you often talk about um, becoming a Christian as pledging our, our allegiance yeah. to Christ. And I, I really like that expression because um, I, I often think about the word Lord and, and Lordship and, and the idea that you know, if Jesus is Lord, the truth is, though, in my own life, I have to surrender my Lordship because there is only one Lord otherwise, and that's myself. And, um, and so I have to daily surrender that Jesus, you are Lord. This is not, this is not for my gain. It's not for my life. It's not for my kingdom. It's for yours and yours alone. And so actually you're right. We don't get to the end of 40 days having had a nice time meeting with God every mm. day and go, mm. great. That was nice. Mm. Um, is actually out to be yeah. that. Those disciplines, those them. habits, mm. they really matter uh, because they enable us to continue our growth, to get bigger picture of Jesus and to get be more open to the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, I just encourage people, if you found some of those habits really helpful, and I think you have, let's keep them going. So we're not going to prescribe a set 
um, devotional. We're not going to prescribe a set pattern of things that people have to do. But a couple of years ago, we did actually come up with the rule of life mm. that we um, we shared. And, and that's available, actually, if you're interested, at yeovil.cc slash rule of life. And that was a series of habits, patterns, things that were worthwhile um, practicing in your own life. So if you're looking for continued structure and you want something, we already have that in place, which you can you can use. Or as Malcolm says, there are hundreds of devotional books. Yeah, yeah. And, and some will work for some people really well and some will choose something a little bit different and that's fine. And I say we can have a little bit of conversation about which resources work for some and which resources work for others. But uh, it's our heart attitude and posture that matters. And if I want to, if I have developed a hunger, a greater hunger for Jesus during these 40 days, don't let suddenly get all obese and fat. Let's yeah. continue expressing that. Yeah. Idea. Yeah, that's really good. And if you had one piece of advice for people listening, watching, one one nugget of um something that's helped you most in your ongoing walk with God, which it's been a few years, um, is there is there something, some practice, something that's really you've always come back to that's helped you? The last, I, I, you, some of you have heard me say it before, I have found the practice of journaling really, really helpful for me. Um, and it's not so much the fact that I write something down, it's that it pauses me to slow down, to stop and to engage with God, because that's what I do when I journal. I write down my conversation with God. Um, and that kind of pausing to reflect consciously in the presence of God has been hugely important for me um, and I'd recommend it to anybody. Brilliant. There you go. Brilliant. Well, if you'd like to know more about journaling, send Malcolm a message or get in touch. Um, but these these 40 days have been absolutely amazing for all of us in so many different ways. And yeah, the, our biggest encouragement and hope is that we don't just finish close our Bibles and uh, and then get on with the rest of it. Actually, this has got to be about what happens here and now. Let's continue to pray for our community. Let's continue to be a blessing and let's continue to see Jesus bigger every day. If you'd like more information on us as a church and to connect and get involved, then just go to our website, which is yeovilcommunitychurch.co.uk and um, yeah, we'll see you soon.